Hi, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Jerry Harris, and I am here at the Walking Horse Report with Jeffrey Howard. We're going to share some information with you today on the uh, situation with the industry. And I appreciate you taking this time to, to do this. Yeah, thanks, we, Jerry. If you got anything you'd like to say out front. No, I think it's, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate you doing this and allowing us to keep everyone informed. And I, I've seen a little bit of your questions, so I think we'll get, we'll get everything covered. All right, well, let's start off with this. Uh, how are the lawsuits looking right now? All right, so um, I think everyone knows that there are two lawsuits. So the Wrights, um, Michael, Josh, and Casey Wright have a lawsuit uh, challenging the enforcement of the existing HPA. Um, that is over in Jackson, Tennessee. Um, the uh, government just um, filed their amended motion to dismiss in that case. And so the industry attorneys from Toradon Law um, will file their answer to that, which is due on um, October the 18th. So uh, we'll hear about October the 18th on both lawsuits, but uh, October the 18th is when we will answer that, uh, and that will get that case moving forward. Again, I think best case uh, or best guess from our attorneys is sometime uh, mid-May for uh, the judge's decision in that case over there. In the rulemaking case, um, we, we have an agreed upon briefing schedule um, with the um, Department of Justice. So um, the, our motion for summary judgment um, uh, from Toradon, the industry's motion uh, for summary judgment is due October the 18th. That briefing schedule should wrap up uh, around December the 20th uh, with a decision to come uh, in January prior to the February 1st um, effective date um, of the rule. So if that were to get pushed out or anything changed, the, the industry would definitely file for an injunction uh, to stay the effective date uh, of February the 1st if the judge hasn't ruled at that point in time. So okay. uh, that's kind of the two updates there um, as, as it relates to the lawsuits. Again, those motions back and forth uh, starting on the 18th um, will be made public um, where people can see them uh, through industry publications, through the breeders, the celebrations, all those websites like that. So we'll get them over to you all as right. well, Jerry. Well, you answered question number two already okay. on the injunction part. Uh, what do you think would be the advantage of putting the BMOs or even the guards on the witness stand? <laughs> um, I probably have to be careful how I answer that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, definitely, I think uh, there are statistical anomalies um, that raise questions in the industry with regards to are there directives being given other than just enforcement of the Horse Protection Act? Um, because if you look at there are some wild variances um, of VMOs past violation rates, um, uh, I think everyone knows that the industry questioned two VMOs specifically, sent letters to the secretary, sent letters to the office of the inspector general um, regarding their uh, enforcement uh, of the Horse Protection Act. and. At the, this year's celebration, um, the, those that had vastly lower violation rates than those two VMOs that we questioned, somehow, uh, after the first day of inspecting at the celebration, they rose to the level of those two or even higher. So I think it would be normal for the industry or anyone to question if someone's two and three year behavior changed at one horse show after you sent a letter questioning their percentages being lower than those of the two that you were questioning and they then went higher than those two. Exactly. So sure, we would love to know how that is. What happened to, to cause that? Were there policy changes? Were there directives from above uh, that said, hey, you're not turning down enough? Maybe they thought the others were doing a better job than them. We don't really know. So yeah, I, w I would love to be able to see um, those questions get answered. I think everyone that had a horse turned down uh, at this year's celebration would, would feel like that. There, there would be some uh, validity placed in that, yeah. Well, I, I agree 100% even as far as bringing some of the guards in. Mm -hmm. we, we know the guards have been privy to conversations that we haven't. And right. I, I think it would be good. Uh, it would be, it's been pointed out the number of false entries made on the inspections and even the work that Frank Eichler did in the research showed where there was false entries as far as taking a non-HPA violation mm -hmm. and calling it an HPA, listing it in the numbers. 
Mm -hmm. What's your feelings on that? So I, I think um, Frank has done a nice job of analyzing that. And now when we report those statistics, and even we've gotten the USDA now uh, as part of the rulemaking, um, they have put in soaring violations and taken out some of those others. But it is, there is no question that to put all violations, uh, to say that all of those are soaring violations is absolutely not true. From heavy chains to heel to toe to illegal shoeing, things of that nature. Um, and then Tail that doesn't even, doesn't even come into, I think where you were headed there is, is you have to remember that uh, until August of last year, so the Horse Protection Act came in in the 70s, right? right. Uh, and many of their training manuals had said a ring injury is not a violation of the Horse Protection Act. Right. And since August of last year, now a ring injury is a violation of the Horse Protection Act. So we're talking about injuries that aren't even on the limbs of the horses. Um, whereas we don't agree with those being a violation right, right. either, but you're talking about on the tail, uh, on uh, you know, all sorts of different places, saddle rubs, things of that nature, right. girth straps, I mean, th that, are, that are causing these slight rubs and things of that nature that aren't even on the limbs of the horses. Uh, so definitely there's, um, when you start comparing statistic to uh, statistic, um, for years those weren't even right. classified as a, as, a, as a HPA violation and now they are. So um, it's a very interesting thing. It's something that we'll challenge uh, moving forward. So, All right. just, and, and I'm doing this just so members of the industry will understand the amount of work that um, Frank Eichler has contributed and I'm going to include two questions into one. If we had a, had to pay someone to do the research and the work mm -hmm. that Frank Eichler has done, how much do you feel, and I know this is just a, a guess, but our cost for these lawsuits, I know everybody's contributing to FAST and, and doing everything under the sun, but how does that relate to the amount of work that Frank Eichler has done? You know, I don't think, I, we couldn't put a, a, a price tag on what Frank has saved us uh, in money, but I think it's safe to say he's spending more time than our attorneys spend on it. Right. Um, and so uh, if you want to take the, the total bills there, uh, if he were charging a similar rate, <clears throat> you know, you'd be talking about double what it has cost. I think um, I've spent a lot of time with Frank over, over uh, since 2009, really, right. uh, on, on these types of issues. And, uh, you know, he, he, does, he does two things really well for us. One is he's a legal mind within the industry uh, that has, has the ability to understand some of these motions, terminologies, things that are happening. He's able to write uh, letters and initial drafts of briefs for the attorneys or, or to send them uh, kind of where the industry's coming from. So I think that is invaluable uh, of what he brings to us from a, a legal strategy. Um, he, he's a part of uh, the Celebrations kind of leadership group. He's uh, on a call weekly with members from the trainers, the breeders, uh, and the Celebration to kind of help guide, you know, what does this mean? Here's where we go, you know, timing of things of this nature. And then two, he does a great job with the statistics uh, and, and being able to track those, um, analyze them, uh, make them make sense. You, you referenced the non-HPA violations, right. the soaring violations. So he works extremely closely with uh, Rachel Reed over at the show HIO. She does a lot of work there and, 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 and there's a lot of people putting in a lot of work, but nobody's putting in more uh, to your point than Frank is and um, he's just invaluable to us uh, and, and a good friend of mine um, as well, but uh, has done a tremendous amount of work uh, on this issue and definitely wants to see a resolution uh, in the industry's favor, um, thinks that we are being wronged, um, and, and I think some of that motivates Frank. Uh, he wants to see uh, it be right, it be accurate, it be, um, you know, uh, fair, and he doesn't feel that it's, it's that way, so uh, I think that's a driving motivation, definitely Debbie's involvement. Uh, but it's more than that for Frank. It, it is really about the industry and him feeling like they are being wronged. Well, there's one thing about Frank Eichler. If you want the truth, you're going to get it. Yes. He, he, he's going to flat tell you the truth. And sometimes, in, in, he and I was after conversation, sometimes I did not like the truth, <laughs> the answer. 
but he he was correct. So these are things that uh, a lot of people misunderstand about him. I believe. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm telling you, he he is he is putting in the work. Whether you agree with everything that's being done or not, he's putting in the work to try to get a resolution for the industry. That's right. Now, here, here's a question that's for everybody out here, really. As an industry, other than showing horses and contributing to the FAST Foundation, part of the legal fund, and we're running, we're running three ads on every show trying to mm -hmm. raise these funds. What can people do? I mean, what can the individuals do out here? I know we need to continue to show horses. Mm -hmm. We need to continue to bring them up for inspection. But what can we do? Is there anything the industry can do that would help more? Yeah, definitely think. Um, one, thank you for all you're doing to help uh, raise the money. That is a, a necessary evil here. Um, but I, I will say just on that. Um, the show cards and exhibitor cards, uh, that's a way, and everybody has contributed there, multiple HIOs, that's not just a one HO, Curtis Pittman show, uh, the, both of those HIOs are requiring those, so it has brought in uh, a lot of funding, um, private donations, horse shows are doing it, so I think people are really contributing, both large and small, every one of them matters, and, and so that's good, but here, here's what people can do. One is stay informed. Um, the facts will help drive um, us to the right uh, solution so be careful to listen to uh, rumor and innuendo I mean it's just stick to the facts every week um, we had it today at 930 two representatives from the trainers two from the breeders two from the celebration and Frank meet every week so people are informed about what's going on um, and so I went to a meeting in Kentucky um, last week for the Kentucky trainers and some of them just to make sure they have it but number two is is document what happens in inspection. Vet reports before, vet reports after, video, written statements, um, that is the most important thing. What we don't wanna see is, is, well, they said this, we gotta have that on camera, or hey, they did this, or my horse was, we have to have veterinarians looking at these horses, making sure that we validate um, that they are sound, that they are in compliance with the Horse, Protect, uh, horse Protection Act, um, so that is something. So just stay informed and document inspection. We don't need stories. We need facts. I'm glad you said that because I received a message this morning, a video, where a gentleman was videoing the inspection and you could hear the BMO telling him to stop videoing that he needed to hold the reins. So that's one thing that people need to realize I do not believe, or I believe that they can stop you from videoing if you're the custodian of the horse, mm -hmm. but you can have someone else to video, and, and in Tennessee that is a law. So they cannot stop you from videoing, but everybody needs to remember if the custodian is going to video, he needs to wear a GoPro or other device. Hands-free device. Mm -hmm. Right. I've got two or three different ones wide angle the trainers have bought two I believe yep. so they're ready available and people need to realize that what they say is vital too yeah absolutely a absolutely I mean like I said I, I can't imagine that anyone government or, or otherwise would care to know just what the facts are that's a, that's what we're doing we're not uh, we're not into the, the business of making accusations we just want the facts and what those show 